If you have your Bible with you today, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 9, or if you'd like to, you can grab one of the Bibles in the pew in front of you and turn to page 1090. Let me tell you, I'm really glad that God, does, God works with people who aren't perfect, because I'm not a perfect person. And I'm still, even you know, after being a believer for 20 years, I'm still not a perfect person. And you know, I keep wondering, I wonder what, what day it'll be when I reach that super Christian status. I'm not there, I don't think I'll ever be. I don't you know, you know when I really get to know people, uh, I haven't met anybody who's a super Christian. <laughs> We're all still fallen and the beauty of the gospel is that it's for everyone, no matter who we are or what we've done. The good news is for everyone. Even someone like Saul. So we're going to read today about Saul changed. Saul was changed. So if you have your Bibles at Acts 9, we'll start reading at verse 1 through 31. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, The Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them, how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. 
but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are gracious to us, that you are so, so good to us, and that we don't have to rely on our own merits, on our own achievements for salvation, but we rely on the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And Father, as we look over the story of a man you used for your kingdom, we pray that you would touch our hearts and draw us closer to you, that we would be encouraged in the mission of Christ as we bring the gospel to the world. Use us, use us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Saul was changed, and we're gonna look through what made this such a drastic event. I'm gonna talk to you today about three calls. Three calls, the first call is the call to redemption. If Saul can believe and he can be changed, then anybody can. It says in verse 1, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. That, that breathing threats, that literally translated means snorts. He was enraged, fits of rage against the disciples. And so he was going to travel to Damascus, and he went and asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. Meaning he was getting permission, extradition letters, saying that we, we're taking these, we want to take them back. We're going to take them back to Jerusalem. So they were, they were leaving, leaving um, Israel. They were going out into a, Damascus, which was a city belonging to the Romans. And so they were going to take them. And I said, so if he found any belonging to the way, we know the way is Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. They, it was, they called the church at the time the way because they were following the way. And so he's going to Damascus to search for them. And he says he also wants to find men and women. That's how brutal he was. He was going for anyone. He didn't care who you were. If you said that you were following Jesus, he was going to take you down. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. So he's on this way to persecute the Christians that, that he was so angry about. And yet, he couldn't see anymore as he's walking. There's light all around him. It was, it was as if it was coming from heaven. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I know I bring this up a lot because we, we want to talk about unity here because we believe that there should be unity in the church based on the prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17. And when he says, why are you persecuting me? That is Jesus saying that he is one with his church. We are, we are one. If you're persecuting them, you're persecuting me. If you, if you have a problem with my wife, you have a problem with me. So does Christ have a problem with, if you're messing with his bride, the church, you have a, you're, you're persecuting Jesus. And he says, Saul, Saul. He says his name twice because he's serious. And Saul in fear said, who are you, Lord? Well, he wasn't persecuting other people. He knew what he was going to do. So we can guess that he probably had some suspicion, suspicion as what just happened to him. The light being all around him, that, that was a manifestation of the glory of God. Similarly to what he would have known from the, the time of the Israelites when they would, were walking in the desert with Mo, Moses following a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. 
And so the light from heaven and the voice would have struck really close to him with all of the scriptures he had studied, knowing it was God. And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what to do. See, the problem with Saul was that he didn't believe before. That's why he was persecuting them, as he was so built up in the knowledge that he had, that he had studied and studied the, the ancient texts, and he was a strict follower of Judaism, but he didn't believe that Jesus had actually risen. He didn't believe that Jesus was actually the Son of God. But with this encounter, he couldn't help but believe because he had a conversation with him. He had witnesses as well. In verse 7, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. And although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. Saul, who had thought he'd seen everything, he thought he, could, he understood it. He had the perfect understanding of the scriptures. He's filled with his own pride. But when Jesus gave him spiritual sight, he took away his physical sight. And for three days, he neither ate nor drank. See, he had come to believe, and that took a while to sort out. If you have an encounter with Jesus like that, if you were driving down the road, and all of a sudden you couldn't see, and you were struck with light, and you heard a voice, and it would take me a few days to get over So he's there and he's praying and he's fasting. He'd heard the call to redemption. Now the call of redemption, that's for everyone, no matter what you've done. Even for Saul, who had persecuted the church, who had torn apart, who was angry. He thought that he had the righteous fury of God against these people. And in the all of his wrongings, Jesus said, I'm going to use you to reach more people for my name. The second call is the call to trust Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Ananias means God is gracious. And so, isn't that interesting that God chose to use a man whose name is God is gracious to go give grace to Paul, excuse me, Saul, right after he had experienced this. And the Lord said to him in verse 11, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So he was given a command. Ananias, a believer, eager, he said, Here I am, Lord. I'm here to serve you. When when he heard the call, he answered, but when he heard the command in verse 13, he said, Lord, I have heard about, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. He was scared. He was nervous. There was distrust. If there was a, a well-known villain in our community and you heard from God to go lay hands on him and pray for him, you'd be afraid, would you not? You might consider packing heat as you went. You might say, God, are you? you must be confused. I don't think you realize who that guy is. That's who this guy was to them. He was a villain. He was tearing people apart. He was tearing families apart. He was taking fathers away from kids. He was taking mothers away from kids. 
He didn't care who you were. Ananias was afraid. And he needed to trust. God was calling him to trust him in his mission. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. He had to trust him because God had a purpose. Whether Ananias knew it or not, God had a purpose for why he was commanding him to do this. Note that in verse, verse 16, after Paul had caused so much suffering to the church and to the ministry, he said, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So that's the thing for our wrongdoing, there's suffering. We experience suffering here because of sin, it's a consequence. But Christ suffered for us so that the penalty of sin would no longer be on us. He took that for us so that we could be redeemed. But in that, he said, Paul will suffer, or excuse me, Saul will suffer here on earth for my name instead of suffering unto the church all of the evil that he has done. And so in trust, in verse 17, in trust, Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. So he was changed. He wanted to be baptized the scales falling from his eyes is symbolic to the veil being removed so that he could live for Jesus Christ. One thing to note is a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of um, theologians believe that Paul suffered with his eyesight for the rest of his life. A lot of his letters, he couldn't pen himself because he couldn't see well enough to write. It was something that he always suffered with, always reminding him that he can't see as well as he thought he could. But he was redeemed for the name of Jesus Christ. And it says, we can see his change in, first, or in, in verse 19, the end of verse 19, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, isn't this the villain? That's, that's their thought. This is the guy who has come to take us from our homes. They were amazed at his change. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. See, Saul had all this knowledge He'd studied and studied and studied. It was something that he was proud of. And he has been using it to condemn the Christians at the time. But now he was using the knowledge that he had been given by the grace of God to share the gospel of Jesus, proving that Jesus was the Christ. And then he got to experience a little bit of his own. In verse 23, many days passed, Jews plotted to kill him, and it became known, and he ended up going out through the city in a basket. They lowered him out. He got to flee what he had been part of. Going through all of this, he gets to Jerusalem and attempts to join the disciples, but it says they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. They were afraid because they had experienced firsthand. They knew about the, the martyrdom of Stephen. They were afraid 
They needed to trust, but they also had the call to love. They needed to love him. But Barnabas, who was an encourager, took him and brought him to the disciples, to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. And then the apostles ended up looking after him. When, when his life was threatened, they sent Saul off to his hometown, to Tarsus. And in verse 31, it says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. We're seeing Acts 1-8 completed, being completed right here in this chapter. So what can we see out of this story today? We see, again, the call of redemption. The call of redemption. Redemption is for everyone, no matter what we've done, no matter what we look like, no matter how we've harmed people, no matter what we've, we've said about God. It's for everyone. You know, and sometimes people we don't like may change. They may be changed by the gospel. People we don't like that we think they're too far gone can still be changed for the gospel. The call to redemption is for everyone in Jesus Christ. We have a call for repentance that we're to share with the world, to share with our community, no matter who they are. Now, a lot of times we, we like to see people as enemies. That's why this same man, Saul, later to be known as Paul, went on to write, in Ephesians 6, that our battle is not with flesh and blood. We're not against the people. The people are the ones in need of saving. The people are what we're about. But we live in a very polar society where things are seen as black and white. The people are against each other. And we like to see those people as the enemy to everything that God wants to do in this country. We see it in our communities. We see hate as we, as we drive down the road, and on pe- written on people's cars. And that shouldn't come from us because we should always know that they can be redeemed by the power of Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. They're not the enemy. But we have to trust in God's plan. Now, we talked last week about being available and being obedient. And Ananias was available. He heard. He heard when the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. He said, I'm available. I'm going to be obedient. But we have to trust in the Lord's plan. There's a, there's a false gospel being spread around our country as well. It's a gospel of prosperity that the, the, whatever God wants for you is, is good. It's for good, and it's whatever you think is good. If you need money, he's going to give you money. And that's not true. The prosperity gospel is not true. God is for your good, but your good is his good because it's about him. And he knows that we will never be fulfilled by money. We will never be fulfilled by comfort. But we will only be fulfilled in him. So we need to trust him no matter where he leads us. Even if he's leading us to someone that we know is a villain. Someone that we know has hated us and has wanted to do evil to us. We're supposed to trust because all can be redeemed. So when he calls us to go, that means to go. 
So if he's calling you to go to the Middle East where there's war and there's, there's people being beheaded for the sake of, for because they claim Jesus Christ, we can't look at it and go, that's not safe. We're not going to go declare the word of God where it's not safe. You've got to make it safe first, God. And he's sending, saying, I'm sending you because you're going to take the gospel to them. And when they're changed by the name of Jesus Christ, then it will be safe. Because Saul didn't stop until he was changed by Jesus Christ. And so no matter where he's calling us, even if it's to the neighbor across the street who's mean, who says terrible things to you, who's grumpy, and you're like, well, he deserves what he's getting. No. There's redemption in the name of Jesus. And in Jesus' name alone. And we need to trust a call. And then the call to love with the disciples. They were afraid of him. They weren't even going to give him a chance. But Barnabas, Barnabas took him aside and said, hey, I'll I'll vouch for you. I'll, I'll take care of you. Brought him to the apostles and shared with them his testimony. When those when people change, we've got to look out for them. We've got to care for them. We've got to be the people who take them before the community and say, look how he's changed. Look how they're changed by the name of Jesus Christ. They're not the same. This is not the same person. This is not the person who is a terror to our community. They're different. Love is a verb. Love means to go. It means to go. Love in a marriage, it means, it means to go. Love is not a feeling, but it's an action. For me, to love my wife means that I'm to love her without any reciprocation, expected reciprocation. I'm to love her and, and take care of her. In the same way, God loved us when we were so terrible and there was no reciprocation, when we were... Um, unfaithful, when we raised our, our voices against him, he came and loved us and cared for us. And so that as we go to people, we need to love them the way Christ loved us. The call of redemption is for everyone. You know, the thing is, is they were scared of Saul, but we're also scared of people who are not as scary as Saul. We're scared of people because of what they might think of us or what they might say to us, or say about us. But in this story, they were afraid that Saul was going to kill them, or take them away from their families, and put them in prison and beat them, or have them beaten. So we can all think of right now, someone that we don't want to talk to about the gospel. That we don't, we're not ready to share it with them because we're afraid of how they may react. And as we read prior, if you remember, Saul was at at the stoning of Stephen. Stephen was bringing the gospel. He was there, he witnessed it. He was for it. So they may not react the way we want them to, but we have to trust the call. Because we never know, we never know what may happen. And the person that we minister to, who we thought would never change, who we thought would never be used for the glory of God, could be the one who becomes a great evangelist or a great teacher or both. Because even though Saul was there when Stephen was killed, it says, in verse 29, he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. The same people, these are the same people that Stephen was preaching to. The same people Stephen was preaching to, he came and disputed against them. These would have been people that he knew. This would have been people that he was friends with, and it says they were seeking to kill him. But he'd heard the gospel, and when he believed, he was changed. All can be redeemed. We've got to trust the call. It's a call to love people. Heavenly Father, 